Elise, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here talking to you. Today, you are one of the most successful 100% virtual law firms in America. You've got a phenomenal firm culture. You've got, you're supported by strong core values. And I, and I definitely want to get into all those things. But before we do, I want to take it way back and start with, you know, if you're open to sharing, what are some of the experiences that shaped you into the leader that you are today? Many things, I would say. Um, one is I was very young when I kind of had to become like the leader of my family. Um, I had a grandfather who had a stroke. And then six months later, his only daughter, who was my mom, had a stroke. And I was, you know, newly married. I think I'd been married four months when my mom had her stroke. And I then took over the care of both my grandparents and my mom. Um, and at the same time was in law school, um, got pregnant in law school. So, you know, then started having children. That was a lot as a, I mean, I was 21, I think, when all that began. And so um, I, I would say, I mean, it might sound silly, but I, learning to lead myself through all that was pretty powerful. Um, a lot of powerful lessons, a lot of mistakes made, obviously, and a lot of learning occurred. I think of that as probably the biggest thing. I mean, my husband would say, you know, I was one of those people. I was class president, you know, student body president, you know, one of those people that really enjoyed those types of things as a young person, but I also had a real rebellious streak as a young person. So I kind of had to rein that in some. What motivated you to go to law school? I actually wanted to do death penalty defense work. The system needs to be balanced. The defense and the prosecution need equal access to experts and quality attorneys. And that's not how it really plays out. And so I really was a huge proponent of death penalty defense and constitutional law work and, you know, did work with the Death Penalty Resource Center and just um, felt really strongly about the process and the fairness of the process. Because we don't have any sponsors and you could say whatever you want, I'd love for you to elaborate on that. Like, why did you feel so strongly? Obviously, I, I think our legal system has to work in such a way where the process is fair and it has to be intellectually honest. And when we have people who are often minorities or other marginalized groups who are getting arrested at higher levels, and then they get put in these defense situations and they get appointed counsel. And in many states, I was from Louisiana, the appointed counsel, I'm not saying they're bad attorneys, but they don't even require a certain level of experience at the time to even represent somebody in a capital case. And then you have these prosecutors who have all the money in the world, all access to experts and investigators. And so when a prosecutor would gain a conviction, it wasn't a fair fight. And I just, in my mind, we can't be killing humans unless we've given them a fair fight. I'm not a massive fan of the death penalty in general, but in, in my world, if it's a fair fight, I can at least understand it intellectually and I can understand the process as being fair. And so I, I just think that's important. So you've used this word, even this th throughout your answer just, just recently, the word fair. And I'm curious as to why that, you know, whether we refer, refer to fairness as integrity um, or even just as simply as the right thing to, to have in society, why that is so important to you. Was there anything maybe in your upbringing or just kind of in your, your experience over the years that kind of shaped you into, into, you know, sharing that belief? I mean, I think a lot of things. I definitely was that kid that was pretty hung up on fairness. Like I just felt like the rules should be applied in a way that was fair rather than, you know, like favoritism and things. And interestingly, I was often the beneficiary of favoritism. And so it's this funny dynamic. My sense of fairness really arose from me watching myself. Like I said earlier, I was kind of rebellious. And so I was this pretty dynamic kid, you know, really outgoing and I could like spin a story with a teacher or the administration and they often would, you know, laugh and just be like, OK, you know, we'll let her go. Then I would see other people in my class and in settings and they couldn't do that same thing. And they would literally get in trouble for less than I should have gotten in trouble for. And I really struggled with that because and I mean, I would sometimes go to back for people. I'd be like, I'm gonna go talk to the administrator for you. And I was like, you know, this is not right. And so um, I think I've just had a real strong sense of fairness. It's one of the reasons sometimes politics today are a struggle. I feel like our processes have gotten a little muddied. Mm -hmm. 
So, so I'm curious in terms of your journey, uh, from, from what I recall, like, you know, out of law school, um, you were working uh, as a federal judicial law clerk, and then uh, you ultimately joined the litigation practice, and then you retired from the law for several years uh, when you were homeschooling your children. Why, why the decision to retire? And then also, I'm just curious, why, why homeschool? Well, I retired because at the time I had my grandmother living with me and I was paying for 24 hour care for her. My parents had bought the house directly behind me. So I was caring for them. And at some point I literally just looked at the bottom line and I was like, and at the time too, I had a daughter in private school in New Orleans in kindergarten. And I thought, you know, I am paying a whole lot of money out. And I was like, this is not really making a ton of sense fiscally. I could be home like swimming with my daughter, having a merry old life and probably be in a very similar situation financially. And I thought, you know, I can teach kindergarten. So I was like, I'm gonna pull her out of her fancy private school. What led, led you to eventually unretire, you know, and re-enter the practice of law? I was getting a divorce and we had to evacuate with Hurricane Katrina. You know, it's a whole a whole ordeal. And um, so we were in Minnesota and we were going to divorce actually before Hurricane Katrina. Like that was when we needed the divorce. Then the hurricane hit like weeks after we kind of made that decision. So we had to stay together for years as we kind of resettled. Um, we moved to Georgia, then to Minnesota. And so then I went back to oh, work. And, and in just Minnesota. just for clarity, when the hurricane hit, you were you were living in New Orleans, right? I was living in right, New Orleans, right. homeschooling right. four children. And that was the best thing ever to be homeschooling during the hurricane because so many kids missed out. You know, they had to change schools. They missed all this education. My kids didn't. They were just like, cool, we're moving. You know, we're going to learn what we're learning, but in a new spot. And we took horseback riding in Georgia. So that was fun. They all learned to ride horses and take care of horses. And I, I'm just like baffled at the amount of things constantly just going on in, in your life. And it's, it's, it's just amazing to me. So why then, um, instead of like going back to work at another law practice, why start your own? Some people are kind of just meant to be visionaries or, you know, like the leader of the firm. I, I mean, I thought about going back to a firm. And to be honest, I applied for a lot, a lot of jobs initially when we lived in Minnesota. And I got told so many times, like, you're never going to be okay here. Like you're a federal law clerk and you're going to go be an associate and have some, you know, 30 year old person who's going to be your supervisor. And I was like, I haven't practiced for a decade. Of course, I'm going to be fine with that. I don't see what the problem is. So at some point I just said, okay, whatever, you know, this is going to be more difficult than I imagined. And at the time, because we were thinking and going through a potential divorce, I had become kind of obsessed with learning about how to co-parent and how to divorce successfully. So initially in Minnesota, I became a guardian ad litem for the state of Minnesota, which is somebody who really advocates for the best interest of children, either in divorce or in dependency cases. So I kind of figured all this learning I'm doing, I might as well, you know, tie it into what I did work-wise. So I started doing guardian ad litem work and then started my own firm in Minnesota. And in starting your own firm, what did you see as kind of like the traditional approach that most family law firms were taking? And how, how did you anticipate your firm would be different? The traditional approach is, you know, we're going to war, like War of the Roses. It's a pretty nasty way of looking at divorce, but it, it's such a win-lose model. I mean, the way the American court system is set up, it's set up for somebody wins and somebody loses. And the reality in family law is, I mean, it's a lose, lose, lose. I mean, the mom loses, dad loses, and the kids lose. The attorneys win because they're making good money. So that's great for the attorneys, but it's kind of stinky for the kids. And so I really was very much about how do we create a win, win, win model? I mean, you know, that if each parent can win and be heard in the process and they can be working to their strengths as co-parents, the children are going to win. The parents are going to win. They're going to be better co-parents forever. Divorce isn't going to be this like real, I mean, almost public health issue where we're, you know, creating all these children with psychological problems. Like divorce is here to stay, whether we like it or not. And I'm a huge proponent of not. Like I would love for all families to not get divorced, you know, ideally. I mean, hence my love of fair play and everything. But it's, it's here. And so let's figure out how to make it psychologically okay. And, and just through your experience, I'm curious, because we had, of course, Laura Wasser on the podcast. We've had Bob Tharp yeah. on the podcast. Like, what are some of the leading drivers of divorce? What leads people to get divorced? What has been your experience? 
I mean, lack of communication, um, a total lack of communication. And women are miserable in most marriages. I mean, women are so miserable and it is, they will put up with certain misery for a certain time. And then often, you know, the husband will do something that in a typical setting, like if it was a positive, close, highly communicative relationship, wouldn't tip the family over the edge, but there's no, there's no storage, no built up goodwill, you know? And I always say like resentment and desire don't live in the same heart. And women are walking around with oodles of resentment about just what's going on in the home, what they perceive to be real inequities. And, and it's a problem. It can't communicate well. You know, you hear about the divorce rate. People say it's, you know, 50% or more. But I am curious, who's typically initiating the divorce? Mostly women because they're just done. And I mean, I can't tell you how many male clients are absolutely befuddled that their spouse is asking for a divorce. I mean, they literally will tell me like, this is coming out of nowhere. And I'm like, you haven't had sex in 10 years. You really think this is coming out of nowhere? <laughs> you know, there's just this total lack of communication. I want to go back to even the, the origination of the firm. So today, the firm's 100% virtual or 100% remote, you know, however people want to call that. Was it always that way? When I started the firm, I mean, at the time, you know, I had all four of my kids at home and my husband has two. So, I mean, we have six kids between us um, and I couldn't like do all the things. How am I supposed to be sitting in my office every day till 630 when I'm supposed to be driving this kid to freshman football or, you know, showing up at this booster thing? So I started the firm completely virtually so that I could do my job from wherever, but I could also be a good mom and selfishly so I could travel. My husband has a job that brings him all over the world all the time. And I wasn't going to like be like, oh, sorry, I can't go to New Zealand because I'm going to be sitting in my cubicle, you know, in downtown Seattle. Like that made no sense to me. So, um, yeah, so we started it virtually so we all could operate and just kind of be our best selves and act like adults and not have to sit in a in a place. And, and how many team members do you, do you have in the firm today? I think we have 56 today. Wow. OK, so so everything you've just described, I mean, it. it you know, obviously sounds amazing. What are what are some of the challenges of, of having this 100% remote model? One is everybody's communication style. I mean, here we are talking about communication again is different, you know, so understanding how much communication each person needs and in what way, like, do they need to get on a Zoom with their leader versus, you know, could they just get a Slack message about something? I mean, so there's a lot of communication dynamics that, you know, we have to deal with. Um, and, and I'm like a 10 quick start. I do everything kind of quick, you know, and I'm just like, I think of something and I'll just send a note. And so people will tell me sometimes like, well, at least you didn't say like, good morning or whatever. So I have to now put in all my happy things, you know, like I do my happy beginning and happy end after I've written whatever my, my quick thing is. Um, you know, so I've had to learn a lot of things. And I mean, then there's just some you know, accountability pieces around with the being virtual and because we have 100% flexibility, like we do not have office hours, like nobody is set to work in the certain times. I know I personally get up at 3 a.m. I am way better from 3 a.m. till 8 a.m. than I am from 3 p.m. till 8 p.m. And so I would rather me do my work then, you know, because I want to get the most out of all my people where they're kind of at their best and they're just flowing along. So, but with that flexibility, you've got to have intense amounts of communication where everyone knows when you can be reached, when you can't, you know, and when you're going to get to something. And then the other thing is that personal responsibility. I mean, to have that level of flexibility, I cannot hire people who are not grown adults who are at the highest level of personal responsibility. Right. So let's talk about the topic of work-life balance. I actually call it life-work integration. I think yeah. balance is a bunch of BS when it comes to what we do. We all work to fuel our lives, you know, and I mean, I think it is a rare person who, you know, is so thrilled about work all the time that they would, you know, say that their life part doesn't matter. I mean, our lives are very important and our families and, you know, whatever drives us. And I think that our work has to really integrate with that. 
And I mean, our firm is so heavily female and, you know, moms. And I mean, they are, the reality is they are juggling way more than 50% of what's happening in the home. And so we provide an environment that allows them to do that successfully. They don't have to ask me to go volunteer at a school or to go take a child to a doctor appointment. Like they're not having to ask permission or, you know, get a favor for, for that. And I mean, as a woman, I mean, somebody who, you know, dealt with that on the regular when I was in a law firm, you f- you literally feel like you're getting a favor when you're, you know, asking, like, can I take my child to the doctor because they're vomiting all over the house? And that's absurd. Like, I should be able to take my vomiting child to the doctor, you know, kind of with impunity. <laughs> I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, but I've also heard you refer to, to family law as almost like an emergency room at, at times. I mean, I guess speaking yeah. of, of the doctor and when you have situations that pop up at, you know, all hours of the night or even on weekends, you're yeah. the type of human being that likes to be available to your clients, you know, whenever they need you. But how do you juxtapose that with also wanting to be at your kid's soccer game or being with your family? Like, how, how do you make both work? If you got a phone, you can do whatever you need to do, wherever you need to do it. I mean, I have have dealt with emergencies on the black beaches of New Zealand. I have dealt with random emergencies on the top of a mountain in Colorado while I was doing a, a college visit with one of my kids. I mean, you do what you got to do. And I think that if you hire the right people who have a certain level of responsibility of care for the clients and understanding what is an emergency versus what is not, because obviously Sometimes a client's going to think something's an emergency and it's actually not like it can wait and it will have no impact negative on them if we wait, you know, till Monday morning to do something versus on a, a Saturday, let's say. But also having a team, I call it a bench, a deep enough bench, kind of like a football team. If you have a deep enough bench, then it works. I mean, I have people who love to work on the weekends because they don't want to be contacted or emailed. They're in their zone. They get up early Saturday morning and they are pumping out six hours of work. And it's literally more like 16 hours of work. And that's what they want to do. But then on Wednesday, they're going to go get their hair done. They're going to go to a soccer game. They're going to go volunteer in their kids class. Like it allows us to all do what works for us. And I mean, to me, it's the ultimate freedom. Like I'm a big freedom person. I mean, I I don't want anyone telling me what to do, when to do it, how to do it. That obviously part of my rebellious nature, I guess. But, um, you know, I think freedom allows you to really live your best life because you get to work in your strengths. Yeah, and, and I would say, I mean, most business leaders, I imagine, would be inclined to agree. I mean, ultimately, as long as the work is being done, as long as you're driving results, as long as you're aligning with the the values and culture of the organization, I mean, I, I think that those are really the most important things. But you mentioned, you know, finding the right people. How, how do you go about finding the right people for the firm? Oh, yeah, that's such an important part of this mix, obviously. Well, most of our people come through word of mouth. I mean, I would say 90% of our people are friends of people who work for us. Um, And I mean, historically, when I first started really growing, I sent out just an email to kind of like, you know, 50 of my closest colleagues and was like, you know, we're looking for these positions. And I purposefully included many people who are excellent at what they do, who I know from my own professional experience. And many of those recipients of those literally came on board. They were like, oh, well, I want to come work there. And I mean, it has been this constant evolution of, you know, getting those personal referrals from, you know, from current people. And then also, I mean, just being frank about what we are and what we're not you know, and really being out there authentically, even like on social media or, you know, in areas where I might go speak, like at a CLE or at a a class where people know, like, I mean, they're not going to see a different me in a, in the, the boss setting, you know, like I'm the same person everywhere. And, and so I think that's really important too, when you're bringing in people that they know exactly what they're getting. And there's no mystery. And then we do a lot of testing. And so our people end up doing like a test, the the real talent assessment with Jay Henderson. They do Colby. They often do Clifton Strength Finders. I mean, we do a lot of tests because 
I try to put pods together based on strengths. Your organization is going to be alluring for a lot of people that, of course, want flexibility, that want to be treated like adults, that, you know, essentially it's a very different uh, organizational structure than your traditional law firm. I don't want to make an assumption, but it probably also attracts a lot of people that, quite frankly, uh, don't want to work. And and, and they you know, see your structure as perhaps a uh, the type of firm where they can kind of do what they want, whenever they want. How do you filter out for that? to make sure that those people don't actually make it into the organization. In the interview, really talking about behaviors and, you know, how they're addressing things just in their life. But if somebody like that has made it through, and I'm trying to think, um, they would be, they would come out from an accountability standpoint because, you know, everyone has a KPI, like whether they're a, a billable employee, you know, we can look at actual productivity. Well, the one thing we do that I think is really powerful is, People choose their productivity level. I do not choose anybody's productivity level. They tell me what they want to work. I tell them what I'll pay them for that amount of work. And so if they don't hit that target, I'm not going to pay them what I've agreed to pay them, like, because they're not doing what they've agreed to do. So then we're going to sit down and have a conversation and say, oh, I see you really would prefer to work this amount. That's totally great. Like, this is how much I will pay you for that amount. And so... It, it allows people, again, it's this agency around their life. I mean, because things change, you know, what you're able to do with, you know, four little kids at home versus four high school kids at home versus being an empty nester, you can work different amounts. You know what I mean? During that time and being flexible and allowing people, again, to have that freedom and that agency to tell us what works for them. And we also invite communication if people want to change. Let's say they're doing great and they're hitting all their targets, but they want to change. We invite them to just come and talk to us. Tell us, you want to go down? You want to go up? What do you want? Like, let's just work it out. So, so I'm fascinated. So at the time where you were unretiring, right, and you were just raised four children, if this type of firm existed, like your firm today, would you have even started your own firm or would you just come to work at a firm like yours? I might have just gone to work at a firm like mine. Yeah. Um, I mean, but that would have been a mistake because I do love owning my firm. Like there is some, I, I mean, I've always thought like being a parent was massive personal growth. Owning a firm is like the personal growth, you know, quadrupled times square. I mean, you know, it has just been wildly important in my own personal journey. I mean, I feel like I have to spend my day with a mirror looking at myself going, what did you F up today, Elise? You know, and and what's, you know, what problems are you seeing in the firm and which part of that is you? <laughs> it's definitely humbling. And and I know we've touched on it a little bit throughout, but you know, I know for you and, and certainly for me and, and a lot of the people that we brought on, like culture is a very, very, very important aspect to their organization. Like how do you describe your firm's culture? Well, I would say it is fun. We call ourselves a unicorn rocket ship. So we're a bunch of unicorn astronauts. And we're always, you know, we love to innovate. We love to come up with new ideas to do things. We like we just redid our accountability chart and it's called Circle World. Like because I hate hierarchies and I was this whole idea of like org charts where the visionary sits at the top. I'm like, that is just BS. I wanted to be in the middle, like in a big circle. So, cause I want communication to flow better. So things like that. I mean, we're, we're always thinking about how, you know, how can we bring our culture and our values to everything we're doing? And so, um, that is really, really important to me. And, um, I think that I, I just, I mean, we hire and fire really 150% on culture. Like I will let somebody go who is the most jamminess employee on the planet if they are a bad culture fit, you know? And I actually learned from you and did a culture call recently and was like, you know, if anybody wants to get off my unicorn rocket ship, I'm like, this is a great day. Like we're going to stop on the moon here. You can exit and it would be awesome. And um, I, I just think culture is everything. I can teach any, and I say I, really not me. I mean, I'm not the best teacher, you know, but other people on my team can teach the skills needed, but we can't teach people to, you know, be innovative, have a growth mindset, care about the clients and care so much about each other. Like that is what, I have this whole idea that if I pour, pour, pour into my team, 
my team then pours, pours, pours into our clients. And like, it's this whole thing. And so if somehow that breaks, like if I have somebody who maybe is a taker and they're just going to take me pouring in, but they're not going to turn around and do that pouring themselves, they're not a good fit for us. And, and speaking of the culture call, so for those listening that do not know what this is, it, it essentially, depending on the frequency at which you want to do this, it is in a meeting, usually like an all team meeting, basically saying to anyone who does not agree with where the firm is headed or doesn't agree with the, the vision of the firm uh, that you are able to kind of, you know, put in your notice uh You'll pay them, you know, any amount of severance with two weeks, four weeks or beyond that. And you can even help them find their next role. So I'm curious, when you did that culture call, did anyone take you up on it? They did not. No. I mean, I was a little surprised. There was a couple of people I thought might, to be honest, and they didn't. And it was interesting because, I mean, I got so many messages from people like, Elise, I am buckled into your rocket ship. Like I am on and we are you know, we are going and it it was great because I think it allowed us to have a shared that shared vision, but also shared vocabulary and shared kind of reset. I mean, I'm going to continue to do them. I think they're a great idea. And I I mean, I said, I think at the time I was like, I don't want hostages in my firm. I want people who are thrilled to be here and they're happy to do the work. You know, like I am not I have no interest in hostages and I would love to help people find their next gig and support them in their next gig. You know, I'm not that type that would get upset if somebody leaves. Like, I'm like, oh, cool. Like, what can I do to help you? And how can I further your career and, you know, be a real supporter of them moving forward? When you talk about a culture call, immediately the thought goes to, well, if, if I offer to pay everyone to leave, they're all going to take me up on it, right? I'm, gonna be, I'm not going to be left with anybody. And I actually think that's probably the perfect time to do a culture call because yeah. if, totally. if, if you believe that everybody would leave if you offered to pay them to leave, then what does it say if they stay, right? They, just the fact that you have Absolutely. a bunch of people that don't want to be there, essentially. Absolutely. If that happened, to me, that would be positive because then I could rebuild with even better culture fits. And I know that sounds a little ridiculous and maybe naive, but I really believe that. I don't think of entrepreneurship as safe. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like all hell could break loose at any moment. And I just have to be able to trust myself that I can build something better next time. That's right. So so speaking of culture, it, you know, with when you talk about a law firm, let's say they have multiple locations, you hear them struggle saying, well, how do we maintain the culture from one office to another office? But when the entire firm is working remote, how do you maintain that team alignment and really consistency across the board from, from a culture standpoint? And it takes a lot of very intentional work. I mean, we use Slack probably very differently than most places do. You know, I mean, we have very, um, you know, specific like work related channels. And then we have many social related things. We also do firm wide things and a variety of them virtually like, you know, we have a book club. So like every week we have a book club for people and they choose the genre. Like they decide what their books they're going to read. We do cooking classes. Like I taught everyone how to make shrimp etouffee because all New Orleanians think that's important, you know, that you should be able to whip up some shrimp etouffee. We do meet and greet. So like on Friday, we'll have like a a meet and greet with a team member and they'll just come on Zoom and people can come and just ask them questions and get to know each other better. I mean, we do a learning lunchbox where people in the firm put on, you know, trainings for things. Um, We just do a lot of things. And then we've had retreats. People will come out to my house and, you know, kayak and go look for eagles and orcas or whatever we do. And, you know, just... um, We just try to really kind of hit all the different things. And we really get to know each other, you know, on this really personal, vulnerable level, which, you know, I think is such an important part of our culture. And and I'd love for you to elaborate on that, because it it sounds like you're doing a lot to obviously invest in your team, whether it's, you know, training and development to even being able to align kind of the the vision of the firm with their own personal and professional growth goals. Um, In terms of connecting with people on a personal and professional level, why do you feel that is so important, especially now? Oh, I mean, I think it is absolutely critical. Younger workers, I mean, all they want is connection and mission and, you know, they want to care about something. Like if I just wanted to like, you know, throw checks at people, 
they don't want that. They want real connection. And I mean, I do personal one-on-one meetings with every single person in my team at least twice a year, if not more, where I, you know, get on the calendar and have meetings. But then all throughout the year, I mean, every week I have time on my calendar where I personally meet with people on my team and I'll have people call me and they'll be like, you know, my kid is going to speech therapy and I'm really struggling. And I know your kid went to speech therapy. Like, how do I handle this? Or, you know, my husband's ex-wife is like making our life miserable. Or, you know, I want to start a cake making business. Can you help me with some contacts so that I could start, you know, and really just caring about people. And I mean, I'm a huge fan of radical candor. And you don't get to have radical candor until you get that caring personally part down packed. And it's just who I am personally. I really love to get to know people. I mean, I, you know, probably should have been a psychologist maybe, but, you know, I spend a lot of time really like understanding people and digging in and, you know, figuring out like maybe what their struggle is and, you know, how can I help them and how do I grow them to be a leader? You know, even if it's just leading themselves differently. But I mean, that's powerful stuff when you're connecting, I think, with people. And, and at least to bring this full circle, let's say somebody's listening and they're, and they're hearing about all the things that you're doing to invest in your team and like how you're leading your firm. And they're like, man, that requires a lot of energy. Um, let's say you weren't doing any of this stuff. Like, how would you say, like, how would that compare in terms of like the service you're providing for your clients? What type of difference do you feel like it really makes? Oh, a lot. A whole lot. I mean... And it does require a lot of energy. Like, I don't mean to, you know, act like it's super easy and I'm, you know, like sitting out on my beach eating bonbons all the time because that is not the reality. I mean, you know, I have to be involved. I mean, I joke that I'm the cheerleader of our unicorn rocket ship. I mean, I'm like Miss Frizzle, you know, like constantly trying to come up with, you know, fun ideas. How can we figure out how to bring better care to our clients? I just don't think you can ever care enough to be honest. I want to transition the discussion to your family, and I've heard you describe it as a modern-day Brady Bunch on the set of Animal House with the pets from Homeward Bound making a Griswold vacation movie. We have six kids from 20 to 30, three girls, three boys, all exceedingly successful young adults, um, darn opinionated, and, um, you know, none of them are sheep. I did not raise a sheep, and so they all have very strong thoughts and opinions. It's busy. I mean, we've had, you know, a lot of pets. I mean, I think at one point we had seven pets, six kids and seven pets. You know, things are bad when you're outnumbered by the the cats and dogs. So, um, but I mean, it's been amazing. Like I, I mean, one thing I have come to learn, I'm 54 and it has taken me my life to learn this. I thought I had a completely normal energy level that every single human had the exact same energy level I had. I have actually come to appreciate I have an abnormally high energy level. I mean, my husband, who I consider to be endless energy, he thinks I put him to shame as far as energy goes. Like we're very well matched in that regard. But it's interesting because our family was like that. We have this very high energetic a bunch of ADHD kids, you know, like these people who are just always like trying to be at the top of their game in everything they do. Um, so it's been it's been challenging. And like I said earlier, I mean, there was a lot of self-improvement I had to go through to, you know, be a decent mom because, boy, is are there a lot of mistakes made in parenting, you know? <laughs> So speaking of which, for the parents listening, if you can go back to, you know, uh, younger at least, what, what have been some of the parenting lessons you've learned? Well, I would say one of the biggest parenting lessons, actually, I learned it from my recon marine son, who at the time was at, you know, one of the muckety muck schools here in Seattle. It's called Lakeside, like Bill Gates, Paul Allen went there, Jeff Bezos's kids go there, you know, really good high end school. And he, as a freshman, is sitting in the car with me. And he's like, mom, got no interest in an Ivy League school, like zero. And I was like, fair enough. And he goes, you know, I want to be the best lineman in the state of Washington. That's my goal. And I was like, okay. And he's like, I kind of need you to get behind that goal. And I was like, okay. And I'm like, what does that mean exactly? He goes, I don't know. I'm a freshman. He goes, we'll have to play that by ear. And, and he goes, but I need you to understand that's my goal. And so that's what I'm trying for. 
And as a mom who's more like type A, kind of like everyone needs to go to college, graduate school, I was just like, huh. But I thought, I mean, here's a 14-year-old boy like telling me this is what's going to move him. This is what's going to motivate him. This is what he cares about. So I do need to get behind that. And I need to just let go of whatever my thoughts were. And he was like a, a B, B minus student at Lakeside. And it was interesting because one day the headmaster said to me, he's like, we need more kids like your Eric. He said, because he knows exactly what he wants. And he's like, that's pretty powerful in a high school age child. And I thought to myself, you know, instead of me thinking like, oh, this child isn't going to, you know, do or be as much as he could be or whatever. I've had to really step back. And I mean, like I said, now, I mean, he actually joined the Marines and then was like, I'm going to be a recon Marine and I'm going to go try to be a sniper. And I'm thinking, what kind of mom skills did I fail to raise a sniper? But whatever. <laughs> and but I mean, you know, you don't get to be a sniper by not like I mean, this kid has he just goes and goes. And it's it's pretty powerful to step back. And and I think in our business, we have to do that too. step back and let people come into their own, use their strengths and go do what moves them and get your own nonsense about what you think and how it should look out of the way. Well, at least I want to I want to shift gears slightly because what would this podcast be if we didn't touch on a topic that I know you were quite passionate about? And it, it you actually shared this book with me. I think it was months ago. It was Fair Play by Eve Rodsky, and this this is fascinating to me in a sense because a lot of the work you do and a lot of like the content that you put out and a lot of the thought leadership you do in a way could I mean if everybody listened could actually hurt your business yeah. right because Absolutely. you're not pro divorce. You're actually trying to you know, advocate for communication and achieving gender equality at home and the things that could prevent divorce. Um, but Absolutely. why in, in particular, when you talk about fair play, I know there's the book, um, it, there, recently the documentary came out. Uh, why in, in particular are you so passionate about this? I just think fair play is, I mean, it is the thing, the missing link we have had in our culture of helping couples be able to communicate in a way that especially men are going to be able to hear it because so many men, and I know that's stereotypical, but it just is the reality. The statistics bear out my stereotypicalness um, that they don't understand all the work behind the scenes and all that mental load that women are mostly doing. And when you look at the card game, that's part of fair play and realize there's a hundred cards involved in running a family, like just a typical family 40 of those cards are kid related. Most men could come up with like six or eight of those. If you just asked them, you know, what do you need to do? They'd be like, you need to bring them to the doctor, bring them to the dentist, you know, get them to soccer practice. And they don't realize all the behind the scene, the finding the pediatrician, calling the insurance company, making sure you have a PPO versus an HSA, making sure that, you know, you don't need a referral to go to a specialist making sure that if they join the soccer team, you've signed them up to get their health forms filled out. You brought them to the physical. You got the coach's gift. You signed up for the email list. You got a carpool. You found out you know, what they needed to do skill-wise to be able to join this particular team. There's a lot of work that goes into it, and so many families break up over this. I mean, and because women cannot do it all. The the stats are alarming at how much the mental load that women have is harming their performance at work. I mean, their brains are literally not able to do all this mental load and then, you know, manage their husband too and keep up with whatever and then supposed to go to work and, you know, work at high powered lawyer, doctor jobs. It's impossible. And it's just, we look at men leaders and so many of them have stay at home wives. And I mean, it's a totally different ball game. If you have a stay at home wife, I mean, I was both a stay at home wife, a business owner. I know what it looks like when you have a competent human at home running all the things you can go to work and really just, I mean, do big, huge things. But if people don't have that, I mean, we have to figure out how to share this more equitably because women are being put behind in work environments and in their home constantly. And it is, in my mind, it is a public health crisis for children. Children are being harmed 
by how our society is working. And fair play actually puts a system on it. We all talk about our works and our offices and how we have to have operational systems and SOPs and we need to do this. Yet our most important group is our family and we don't have a system in our family. That's nonsense. Like, of course we need a system in our family. And of course we need shared vocabulary. And one of the things about fair play that's so wonderful is it encourages you to share your why. So like, let's say you have a woman who's like wrapped around the axle about taking the garbage out every day. And the husband is thinking to himself, this woman is flipping crazy about the garbage. Like, I do not understand it. She might be like, came from a single mom home where every time she walked into the kitchen, when she was little, there were roaches because there was garbage around and there was bugs. It might bring up all this shame and this financial story she's living under. When you go through the cards as a couple and you talk about your why and you really explain why this might matter to you, it literally completely changes your desire to want to do the thing and help each other get the work done. I mean, and if, and if it doesn't, you're probably not, shouldn't be married in the first place. Like if people's deep seated whys don't move you, then, you know, there's probably a bigger problem. And maybe you do need to come talk to me at that point. But um, ideally, I could rid the world of divorce. And yeah, I'll figure out something else to do. I assure you. It's no secret that I think the majority of the legal profession, at least a lot of the firm owners, are are still primarily male. I imagine many of the listeners of this podcast are male. And when when they hear things like this, I imagine some could be taken aback or even taken taken offense. I'd love for you to share kind of what's the end goal of all this, because ultimately uh, this is really about making sure that if you know if, if everything is done right at home and if people feel supported and they're happy at home, that reflects to other aspects of their life. So before all the men start feeling like, man, I'm, I'm not doing enough and why? you know, is this really my problem or I feel like I work really hard at the office and all those things. It's like, what, what are you really saying here? Uh, more sex, like a happier life. Your whole life looks better. And most importantly, like one of the most profound things when I watched the documentary, Eve's husband, Seth, is just amazing. He literally, you watch his transformation through the documentary. I mean, and she, I mean, tells some hilarious stories, you know, about Seth and and I mean, Seth's got a big, huge job. He's a big, big earner, you know, doing his thing. But he talks about the real power of what his buy-in has been to his marriage and what his buy-in is for his children. And I mean, he's got two sons and one's like, you know, 14-ish kind of age. This child is watching before his eyes, his father step into his role at home. It will... It will change an entire family because of this. I mean, our entire society needs to change. And no doubt there's a lot of male, you know, firm owners and they might, you know, think this is really hard or whatever. I mean, one, I mean, so much of the work can be delegated. Like, you know, it's not like you have to step in and, you know, manage all the soccer team stuff. Like, but you have to understand that you know, your wife can't do it all. Like it is impossible to do it successfully. And like I've said before, resentment and desire do not live in a heart. If you want a happy wife who wants to have sex with you on the regular, figure out how to get rid of all that resentment because the two don't live together well. A lot of what we've talked about throughout this podcast, it does require a tremendous amount of energy. But I'm curious, is there, are there any particular habits that you either practice that keep you just on track and engaged and just being able to just function at this peak state day in and day out? I do wake up really early. I really enjoy waking up early and having that quiet time because one of the things I think for me is so important is focusing on the three things that can move my life forward. And so in my mind, I look at it as, what is the one thing I'm moving and I should be doing all my focus on for my work? What is the one thing I should be doing all my focus on for my health? And what is the one thing I should be doing all my focus on for my family, whether that's my marriage, my kids? And so obviously those things change over time. You know what I mean? Like I, I might have a child who's struggling and so I might be really focused on one child and what I can do to really help that child and how am I going to help move that needle? But asking myself those and what those three things are and then breaking that down into tasks that I'm doing to meet those goals and then saying no to absolutely everything else. 
like saying no, I mean, 99 times out of 100, you know, because and I have to ask myself, like, is what you're asking me to do moving one of those three things forward? And if the answer is no, then the answer is no. And I had to learn to say no really boldly and with a whole lot of joy. So um, because I definitely had people pleasing tendencies, I think. And, you know, so just learning to say no and stay focused is really important for me. And at least as we come to a close, this being the, the Game Changing Attorney podcast, what does being a game changer mean to you? It means having impact on bigger issues. And, you know, for me in my firm, that's creating an environment that allows people to be their best selves, both working and in their families in, in whatever arena they want to be. And I think with fair play and kind of my passion around fair play is, I mean, let's really think about how do we make our society stronger rather than breaking apart.